Over the next several decades, word spread from Luxor to across Africa and throughout the Middle East that a potentially supernatural substance that was once created by ancient Egyptians was now on the black market via abandoned Cold War experiments. Back in Egypt, some magic practitioners claimed that the red mercury can actually be found in the throats of many mummies, not just Amun Tefnacht, hence fueling the tomb raiding industry within the country. They state that if someone possesses this liquid, they'll be able to communicate with the jinn, who in turn will grant wealth to its owners. And these are not just ordinary jinns, but creatures who are almost Lovecraftian in scale. The kings of the jinn. In the late 1980s, rumors about an alleged discovery of an anomalous material in Luxor, Egypt, had begun to spread across Europe and the Middle East. According to a diverse range of scientists and archaeologists, this powerful mineral with ancient Egyptian origins is meant to be both a geological and supernatural anomaly that has the ability to not only spontaneously create nuclear fusion, but also tear a hole between our dimension and the dimension of the jinn. The chemist gives us a photograph which he says shows a bottle of red mercury stolen from a secret production plant. There are rumored to be three sorts of red mercury, a toxic powder which is irradiated to form a liquid, the second form. The liquid is then implanted with a rare isotope to make the third form, RM2020. This is highly radioactive and can be used in the manufacture of nuclear... Did Cold War era scientists successfully replicate this mineral? And where does the boundary between a carefully orchestrated hoax and a legitimate supernatural threat begin? It was the early 90s, the Cold War was over, and a new era of global history had begun. However, decades worth of rumors and secrecy regarding occult experiments taking place in Eastern Europe had begun to spread across the region. One of those experiments concerned an anomaly called Red Mercury. Although today it's more famously known for its supernatural properties, at that time, the media was only interested in its practical use as a component in developing nuclear material. Its primary end users were speculated to be major aerospace companies in the United States and France, along with business interests across Africa and the Middle East. The New York Times and various other Western news outlets had expressed concern over this element, especially since leading scientists like the late Samuel Cohen stated that with just a particle accelerator, the red mercury anomaly can be detonated, producing a pure fusion mini-neutron event. Although over the next decade, the International Atomic Energy Agency would state that the red mercury is nothing more than science fiction, the rumors surrounding its existence and its potential supernatural origins would continue to grow for years to come. We will discuss in detail the paranormal aspect of this anomaly shortly. However, whether its natural or not supernatural attributes was a primary global concern between the late 1960s and early 1990s. The most important voice supporting the existence of this anomaly is the aforementioned Samuel Cohen. He was one of the world's leading scientists and is considered as the father of the neutron bomb. In 1944, he worked on the Manhattan Project, arguably the most important nuclear research and development program of the 20th century, as well as the other groundbreaking energy initiatives. However, this has not stopped other scientists from dismissing his statement regarding the existence of red mercury, calling his description of the element as unverifiable and unprovable. Researchers such as Eric Crotty and James Ritz write that the red mercury is most likely a code name for another type of illegal chemical that has no anomalous attributes. Meanwhile, other scientists say it's only an urban legend, likely created by an intelligence agency or criminal organizations, designed to scam those who intend to purchase and use it to cause harm on a mass scale. 
while in 2022, there continues to be speculation on whether or not the Red Mercury is real, who has sthenicized it, and who's currently buying it. Its origins appear to be traced back to ancient Egypt and a mid-20th century discovery made in Luxor's Valley of the Kings. According to several Arabic language outlets, during the 1940s, an Egyptian archaeologist named Zeki Saad Ali had discovered a strange red vicious liquid hidden beneath a sarcophagus of one of its mummified pharaohs. Some say it was found under the mummy of Amun Tefnacht, an ancient Egyptian commander who lived during the 27th dynasty, although other sources remain vague and even contradictory about the details. This confusion surrounded its initial discovery would continue well into the 1960s, when scientists from Eastern Europe allegedly became involved. Apparently, some of the anomalous liquid is currently preserved in one of Luxor's museums. Back in 1968, a classified paper allegedly revealed that the red substance buried with Amun Tefnacht had a density of 23 grams, potentially making it one of the most powerful elements in existence. The report presented the anomaly as a superior alternative to pure plutonium, which only has a density of 20 grams. According to Arab media, upon the release of this information, further research suspiciously concluded that the substance found beneath Amun Tefnacht did not contain any red mercury, just regular embalming fluid created for mummies. Consequently, many Luxor locals at the time who were aware of the research did not believe in its conclusions. This skepticism may have been fueled by prominent witch doctors who not only confirmed that its anomalous attributes are real, but it's also something that the jinn are actively looking for, since it can give them, and even humans, the gift of immortality. Over the next several decades, word spread from Luxor to across Africa and throughout the Middle East that a potentially supernatural substance that was once created by ancient Egyptians was now on the black market via abandoned Cold War experiments. Back in Egypt, some magic practitioners claimed that the red mercury can actually be found in the throats of many mummies, not just Amun Tefnacht, hence fueling the tomb raiding industry within the country. They state that if someone possesses this liquid, they'll be able to communicate with the jinn, who in turn will grant wealth to its owners. And these are not just ordinary jinns, but creatures who are almost Lovecraftian in scale the kings of the jinn. The anomaly is understood to be used for casting extremely powerful spells, divination, and as already mentioned, it can allow humans to interact with the jinn kings. According to the historian Ali Alumi, within our folklore, there are the four cardinal jinn kings, powerful elemental beings who command entire kingdoms of spirits. They go by the name of Mazir, Kamtan, Taikal and Qaswara. Then there are the seven jinn kings associated with the planet, and the days of the week is a manner similar to Greco-Roman mythology. Al-Mudhib is the ruler of Sunday, and is often referred as the golden king and a master of alchemy. Then there's Mur al the jinn king of Monday and the moon. Al-Ahmar is the jinn king of Tuesday and Mars. This red-colored entity is the ruler of the Qareen. According to Islam, each human has a Qareen assigned to them and can be a source for good and evil. Then we have Barqan, the Jinn King of Wednesday and the Monarch of Mercury. He's also known as the Black King and is a teacher of magic. The Jinn King of Thursday and Jupiter is Shamurish. He's actually understood to be a wholesome and friendly Jinn with some tradition saying that he had converted to Islam after interacting with the Prophet, peace be upon him. Then there is Zauba, the Jinn King of Friday and Venus, who manifests in our dimension as a whirlwind. And finally, there is Maimun, the Jinn King of Saturday and Saturn, a winged being associated with plagues and astrology. There are more kings out there, but to list them all will take us way off topic. Now, it should be noted that this information is primarily derived from pre-Islamic folklore. Consequently, many Muslims will dismiss much of this as fantasy. The same can be said for the Red Mercury Anomaly, 
that can help humans interact with these kings, and other fantastical elements from regional mythology, such as the Philosopher's Stone. In fact, it's believed that Red Mercury, via magic, is a key ingredient of the Philosopher's Stone, granting its users the gift of immortality. Within the Middle East, magic not only serves as folklore, but also as a lucrative criminal business model. So while you'll have legitimate practitioners of the craft doing everything from casting love spells to performing exorcisms, all of which are illegal within Islam and Muslim countries, you'll also find many con men claiming to be able to do the same. One prominent figure named Hamid Adam, who's a former sorcerer, speaks of this. After completely renouncing the practice of magic and returning back to Islam, he has quite openly spoken about his former career as a magician and his supernatural experiences, including his encounters with the Red Mercury Anomaly. Adam confirms that the element serves as a form of nourishment for the jinn, making them immortal. However, they can't directly acquire it themselves as the substance contains metaphysical properties that require human interaction for its benefit to become activated. And this is where a different kind of scam begins. Which doctors state that in order to obtain the mineral, some of these jinn or demons would employ the help of scam artists, fake and real witch doctors and any other human individual willing to complete the handover to them. Whatever fake ritual or spell human does to fool other humans into obtaining the mineral is irrelevant. The only goal for the jinn is to get the substance in its hands, but in return, that person performing the transaction will benefit financially. The money he or she obtains could come either via the scam itself, where the victim hands over the money to the magician or con artists, or according to Adam, through a supernatural means, where the jinn physically transforms natural objects into money, or displaces that money from another location on the planet into the hands of the magician. In 2008, across internet forums and other social media platforms of that time, a rumor began to spread stating that a number of Singer's sewing machines in the Kingdom of Jordan contained trace amounts of red mercury. The source of the story came from a German national who had traveled to the country claiming to be a treasure hunter. While there, he convinced a number of investors that him and a Jordanian colleague had discovered the whereabouts of large stashes of ancient Roman gold worth billions, but he required funding for equipment and red mercury to extract it. In an earlier episode, we spoke of how Moroccan witch doctors used the jinn to discover where buried treasure had been hidden across their country. In order to access that treasure, these witch doctors would typically perform a ritual bloodletting ceremony for the jinn by dismembering a child in the process. In a similar but far less gruesome manner, the Jinn of Jordan only requested red mercury and not blood to access the treasure. According to the German, the easiest way to get a hold of their substance would be via these Singer sewing machines that contain trace amounts of the substance. Once an investor had found the specific model of machine set to contain the anomaly, the machine's owner would promptly raise its price to an insane amount. Investigations later revealed that all of the original owners of these machines were in one way or another already directly connected to the German. It did not take too long for the Jordanian and neighboring Saudi authorities to learn about this scam and stop it. However, by then, word had already been spread across the region that this model of sewing machine contained the anomaly, and thus the price of the brand continued to skyrocket from 200 riel to over 200,000. However, the story does not end here, as there may be a dangerous truth buried within the fiction. Shall we try HG2, SB207? Two. Two, excellent. The only Western reference, however, is in 1968, a paper written for the huge American chemical company DuPont. Why no reference since then? Well, it suggests to me that it is probably either used for military purposes or is a very secret industrial compound. Back in 1968, 
when word of the experiments on the Amun Tefnacht mummy became public knowledge. A report was published later that year by DuPont, an American chemical company that develops nuclear material for the United States. According to the investigative journalist Peter Human, in late 1992, the UK's Sunday Times gained access to this report, where they discovered that DuPont had synthesized a powerful chemical with the exact same formula as red mercury. This compound was added to the International Chemical Register, where it's listed till this day. Now, not only did Samuel Cohen vouch for the existence of this anomaly, but according to Peter Homan, a number of other leading scientists also believe it's real. The Sunday Times article published on the 18th of October 1992, which he refers to, mentions at least one other leading commercial manufacturer that had began replacing the element. The article goes on to quote Dr. Frank Barnaby, a noted British nuclear expert, as saying, Statements by officials that dismiss this possibility either mean they are willfully ignorant about red mercury or they're lying to cover up a grave threat to the world. So, in conclusion, is red mercury real or just a scam? While mainstream consensus states that its ancient Egyptian origins and its Cold War development is only an urban legend, there still seems to be at least two types of harmful hoaxes related to it. The first is where ordinary conmen from across the region, Asia, and even Europe are scamming individuals with ordinary red liquid, pretending it's red mercury. The second is where the jinn, in its alleged attempt to become immortal, will try to convince a human to physically hand over a sample of the real anomaly to them via a magician. The main victim here is the one who paid to initiate this transaction, who ultimately gains nothing from it. The truth may exist in a grey area between these possibilities. Although many aspects of the Red Mercury anomaly have been exploited by conmen, even without the Jinn being the facilitator of the hoax, the fact that reputable scientists and reformed witch doctors alike have genuinely testified to the truth of its existence. The practice of human gin interaction is commonly accepted as potentially harmful, exposing the human to terrible forces beyond his or her understanding that can cause physical ailments, mental illness, hauntings, and even death, as well as literal demonic possession and the potential for opening of a doorway for more spiritual entities to enter into our world. Within Islam in particular, it's stated that the veil between our dimensions is deliberately shielded to restrict this interaction, and most jinn respect this nor have any interest in communicating with humans. However, if a jinn chooses to try and cross this boundary for whatever reason, like obtaining red mercury, if it's real, then there is the likely chance that it's not a friendly one, and it may well do harm. In the next episode, we'll take a deep dive into the Philosopher's Stone and the Emerald Tablet of Thoth and their existence in the 21st century. And in the meantime, if anyone offers you any strange red liquid that's not Vimtu, just leave.